This is Sonia welcoming you to edition number 2137 of the Enfield Talking Newspaper, dateline 22nd of March 2018. The readers this week are Jenny, Roxana and myself, with Dem on the controls. The editor was Linda and the production and distribution team is Keith, Joan and Jan. Our title music is Country Rock Polka, composed by Pat Prilly, Fernand Bouillon, Harry Breuer, and performed by Jean-Jacques Perret, and is used with his kind permission. The local news stories that we'll be reading come from the Enfield Independent and are their copyright. The events information has been collated by us from other sources. The lead stories this week are Man Dies After Being Stabbed and Shot and We Are So Worried. Before the news, we have one or two special news items and notices first. The sunrise and sunset times for the week beginning Monday the 26th of March are 06.49 and 19.23. We also have a special notice from Diane de Jersey, who reminds us that there will be no talking news on the 29th of March due to Easter. And there will be no Enfield Vision Forum meeting on the 2nd of April for the same reason. Do get in touch with us to share your own news and special announcements. We love to hear from you. If you have any comments about the Enfield Talking newspaper, please phone Diane de Jersey on 020-8805-6578. She is your listener's representative and will be pleased to help you. Now Jenny will read the first item of local news. A man died after being stabbed and shot in an unprovoked attack. The man in his early 20s was found in South Street, Enfield, at 12.40am on Saturday. His next of kin have been informed and a post-mortem will take place. Another man was also found with stab injuries and remains in a serious but stable condition in hospital. The victims were with some friends outside the parade of shops in South Street near the junction of Scotland Green Road at 12.40am when the attack took place. Four people approached the victims from the direction of Curlew House, which is behind the shops. They were all dressed in dark clothing, wearing hooded tops with the hoods pulled up. Detectives from the Met's Homicide and Major Crime Command are investigating. Detective Chief Inspector Andy Partridge, who is leading the investigation, said this was a totally unprovoked attack on the victims, with the level of violence used being utterly deplorable. The suspects arrived together, coming from the direction of Curlew House. They fled together along an alleyway to the side of the Oasis Academy heading towards Sandhurst Road, passing the allotments and industrial estate. Whilst the attack only took minutes to carry out, I want to hear from people who may have seen them in the area before the attack or afterwards when they fled towards Sandhurst Road. Any fragment of information could assist the investigation. Please do not assume that we already have your information. There have been no arrests and inquiries continue. Anyone with information should call 020-8358-0300 or Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 You can also tweet police via at METCC. We are so worried... Family plead for autistic son to move home. The family of an autistic man with Parkinson's disease are pleading with the council to let him home. Kevin Smiley, age 53, was told he needed to move out of his council-owned flat in Lawson Road, Enfield, for a week, 
while workmen fixed a leaking shower. But almost three months later, he's still in temporary accommodation without his clothes and belongings. His mum, Diane Smiley, said he's become completely withdrawn in his new surroundings at Fairview Care Home, Bridge End Road, and sleeps with a chair propped up against the door. Mr Smiley said, We're so worried about Kevin. He likes his own space, doesn't like his things touched, and enjoys his freedom to come and go as he pleases. Since he moved out, he can't cope with the uncertainty and doesn't feel safe. His mental health is really deteriorating. I honestly don't know what is taking the council so long. What started as a leak to the shower has now turned into mould and mildew throughout the whole flat because it's been left for so long. When my son Robert went around the back... I'll start that again. When my son Robert went around, the back fence had been broken down. The situation seems to be getting worse, not better. And all the time, poor Kevin's health is deteriorating. Kevin worked for Sainsbury's for 27 years before the onset of Parkinson's two years ago. And before that, he travelled widely, cycling down the Nile for Mencap Blue Sky Appeal and also from Argentina to Chile. But since the acceleration of Parkinson's disease, he is virtually paralysed down one side. Ms Smiley added, As a family, we have done everything in our power to get Kevin back into his own home. We have spoken with the council many times, but nothing is happening. When contacted by the Enfield Independent, an Enfield Council spokeswoman apologised for the delay. She said, We will be contacting Mr Smiley to inform him as to when the work will be carried out. A Conservative London Assembly member says that Mayor Sadiq Khan needs to build more homes in order to address the housing crisis in London. Andrew Boff, Deputy Chairman of the Housing Committee, said 35 to 40,000 houses could be being built a year to help meet, meet housing needs in London. He said, the Mayor has taken his eye off the ball and is building fewer homes than his predecessor. We want more homes now, not in four or five years' time. The Mayor has to build more homes. He said he would ensure the building of 80,000 homes a year, but last year he built 17,000. That was about 20% fewer than his predecessor. The mayor keeps on talking about it being a marathon rather than a sprint, but for those that are homeless, it's a bloody sprint. It is the responsibility of the Greater London Authority to build homes. As long as we haven't got homes being built people are going to become homeless. The politician also argued that imposing rent controls, an option some campaigners are arguing would be one way of tackling the solution, would only serve to reduce the supply of properties available to rent. Tom King, 25, who is a member of the London Housing Campaign, said that imposing rent controls is an important pillar of solving the housing crisis. He said, there needs to be a bolder solution for the housing crisis and a long-term solution to people renting in the private sector. If we limited rent controls in line with inflation, I don't see how that would make loads of landlords flee. In general, it's just about making rents affordable it wouldn't stop renters making a profit. Housing isn't there for people to make money from, it's for people to live in. It's not just one measure that's going to solve the housing crisis in the capital, there needs to be mass building and more building of social housing. The group is calling for the mayor to have powers to control rents between tenancies. A woman who survived the Holocaust says she feels she has to continue telling her story. Janine Weber, who lives in Oakwood, Enfield, spoke to children at Hyams Park School in Waltham Forest recently about the importance of remembering the genocide. Born in Lwów in eastern Poland, Miss Weber was only seven when the war started. The town was occupied by the Red Army, from 1939 
until the Germans invaded the USSR in 1941. She recalls the Nazi terror starting with men rounded up and her father jumping from a balcony to evade capture. The 85-year-old said, That was my first experience with the Nazis. I was frightened and couldn't understand what was going on. Janine, her parents, seven-year-old brother and grandmother were then forced to leave their flat with a few belongings. They secured a room in a small house on the edge of the city, but soon faced searches. She said, When we heard the Gestapo shouting horrible Jewish names, my mother, brother and I hid in the wardrobe. There was no room for my father and grandmother, who hid in the loft. The Gestapo found them, and I heard my grandmother scream. Miss Weber's mother told her father was shot. She does not know what happened to her grandmother. She said, I was frightened all the time. The only emotion I remember during the war is fear. The Gestapo always had shiny black boots. For years I had a nightmare that the boots were coming to get me. The family was moved to a ghetto where the bodies of dead children littered the pavements. The Nazis forced families to watch hangings to inspire terror. Mrs. Weber's mother died in the ghetto after catching typhus. She was 29. Janine's uncle found her and her brother hiding pla- found her hu- her and her brother hiding places on farms, but her brother Tunio was shot by an SS man when he was 7. She finally found safety through the caretaker of a convent whose name her aunt gave her. She and others lived in an attic and then a bunker with 14 other Jews before she was given a new identity. She says, I'm still a little bit frightened. It hasn't left me completely. I have to speak about it because without me, nobody would know what happened to my family. London Assembly politicians have called for the Health Board to be more transparent in making Londoners aware of the Mayor's health agenda. The London Health Board, which was set up in 2013, is chaired by Sadiq Khan and comprises of local authority leaders and representatives from the health sector. Members of the Health Board and the London Assembly Health Committee met yesterday to discuss issues such as the role of the health advisers, progress on the development of the health inequality strategy and other mayoral health initiatives. But during the meeting, which was chaired by Onkar Sahota, chair of the London Assembly Health Committee, and deputy chair Susan Hall, concerns were raised that the Mayor's Health Board lacked transparency and the issue needed to be addressed. Addressing Dr Tom Coffey, senior advisor to the Mayor on Health Policy, and Yvonne Doyle, statutory health advisor and London Regional Director, Public Health England, Mrs Hall said, the board could be completely transparent. Give us a reason why it shouldn't be transparent. Mr Coffey responded that the board was due to meet in April, where the issue of transparency of the board would be discussed. He said... It is not a meeting open to the public at present because we're in the process of developing the London Health Board. When the board first began meeting, it was in private, but Mr Coffey said that the move towards publishing the minutes was taken in a move to make the board more transparent. Yet Mrs Hall questioned how effective the board was at doing this and how much transparency the board was actually providing. She said... For the last meeting, which was three months ago, the minutes have just gone up. When questioned by Mrs Hall about the transparency of the health board and whether four meetings a year was sufficient, Professor Yvonne Doyle said that the important thing was that work was being taken on in-between meetings. Mrs Hall said, If work is going on sometimes, it needs direction. I'm sure we'd hear about the work if it was a transparent, if it was transparent, sorry, but two years on and we haven't. She added, if there's nothing going on that needs to be hidden, what on earth is the problem? Mr Onkar added, Londoners need to be convinced the health board is addressing their concerns. 
Mr Coffey said that he has taken the advice on board and relayed the advice and hopes the proposal increases transparency. Parents of disabled children marked the momentous moment the first brick was laid for a new children's hospice. Noah's Ark Children's Hospice in Bing Road, Barnet, is celebrating the first devoted hospice for children with life-threatening conditions in North London, looking after children in Barnet, Camden, Enfield, Islington, Haringey and Hartsmere. Two mothers of disabled children joined in on the celebrations by laying the first brick. Nicky Stiles' son, Brandon, has a condition which stunts his development and he still looks like a child, even though he is 17. I see the new Noah's Ark Hospice building as a place to come together as a family, said Miss Stiles, 44. To be able to spend time with others in similar situations, supporting and sharing the good and the sad times. Shakila Ali's son, Gibran, six, has charge syndrome, a genetic disorder which affects his heart, breathing, sight and hearing, and he has to be tube fed through his stomach. His mum, 40, said, The new Ark building will be a great place for many London families facing challenging times. They'll be able to connect and meet with other families with similar experiences, which is always a help. The hospice is a seven-acre site built next to a nature reserve to provide a peaceful environment. The Ark is the first children's hospice in north and central London. The new hospice will feature bereavement rooms to give families a place to stay. Chief Rue Watkins, 55, said, It's right for any child to be together with their family when they die, and now we will have the ability to look after families when their child has died as well. A grandmother of seven has told her story of how losing her husband to cancer inspired her to pursue a new career in social care. Diane Howells, 60, was unsure where her life was heading after the death of husband Stephen in 2013. She had also been made redundant from her job at Tesco after 23 years and moved to North London from the Midlands to live near her daughter. It was there she decided to enrol on an apprenticeship in health and social care. I had no background in it, but had spent a lot of time caring for Stephen and raised my family and thought it was something I could do, said Diane. I enjoyed going to college and all the training and learnt so much. At first, I thought I'm going to be the oldest one there, but it didn't matter. There were people of all ages and backgrounds, young mums and some men wanting a career change. It opened my eyes and showed me there are so many things I can do and it's given me so much more confidence. The training I had was excellent and I still use my portfolio of coursework from college to refer to. The apprenticeship took place at Glenpat Homes in Winchmore Hill, which provides a residential care home and purpose-built block of flats, along with care support for people with learning disabilities. Towards the end of the apprenticeship, Mrs Howells was taken on as a support worker and after her skills were recognised, she was soon promoted to a more senior role. Theo Ackham, services manager at Glenpat Homes, said, Diane has a passion for working in care and has excelled in her job. She took to the role very quickly and is now leading her own team. She is one of the best staff I have here. The apprenticeship was provided through the College of Haringey, Enfield and North East London. Mrs Howells added, I work with a lovely team and the job is so varied. It's given me a new lease of life. I just wish I'd done it when I was younger. Stephen would have said, do what you want to do now. And it's worked out wonderfully. 
He would have been very proud. Black cab rapist John Warboys will be banned from entering Greater London if his prison release is upheld by the High Court. Three leading judges are currently deliberating on whether to overturn the parole board's January decision to allow the serial sex attacker to leave jail after hearing two days of legal argument. The judges have reserved their ruling to a date yet to be confirmed and have also continued a temporary bar on the 60-year-old's release. If released, Warboys would be barred from entering Greater London or Sussex and has agreed to a raft of extra measures, including electronic tagging and lie detector tests, his barrister Edward Fitzgerald QC told the court. Going blind is a frightening thought, yet many of us know very little about glaucoma. Known as the silent thief of sight, the condition currently affects as many as 700,000 people across the UK, with some 50% of cases remaining undiagnosed. Glaucoma usually occurs when the optic nerve, which connects the eye to the brain, becomes damaged as a result of fluid building up in the front area of the eye, which in turn increases pressure within the eyeball. If left unchecked, it can cause irreversible damage to vision, so it's important to diagnose and treat glaucoma early. The only way to do this is to go for frequent eye checks. Here, Specsavers optometrist Dr Josie Forte shares seven facts about glaucoma. 1. People with 20-20 vision can have glaucoma and not realise it. You may not notice any difference in your vision because it tends to affect your peripheral vision first, which you may not even be aware of. It's only when it progresses to moderate or advanced glaucoma that people start to notice changes to their vision quality. 2. Age, family history and even ethnicity all play a role, explains Dr Forty. If you're over 40, have a family history of glaucoma, are short-sighted or diabetic, you have a higher risk of glaucoma and should mention this at your next sight test. 3. Research has found that ethnicity can increase or decrease the risk with glaucoma more common in people of African, Caribbean or Asian origin. 4. Glaucoma can usually be detected during a routine eye test, often before it, no, before it causes any noticeable symptoms. The test does not hurt or feel uncomfortable and should only take around 15 minutes. 5. It is not an age-related sight loss condition, says Dr Forty. Primary open-angle glaucoma becomes more common as you get older. And although it is uncommon before the age of 40, it's important to get checked for the early signs. 6. It's not possible to reverse any loss of vision that occurred before glaucoma was diagnosed but treatment can help to stop any further visual impairment. Regardless of whether someone with glaucoma has noticed damage to their vision or not, the condition can often be managed with specific eye drops. 7. If a close relative has glaucoma, you have a greater risk of developing it, stresses Josie. So your routine eye test may be funded by the NHS. If you think you might qualify, speak to your optician for more information. If you're worried about glaucoma, advice is available on the high street. Specsavers, optometrists and trained store team members can provide information about glaucoma. Stress is a normal part of life and sometimes can actually be helpful. It's designed to help you take action, perform better and get results. But if you're regularly feeling overwhelmed and unable to cope, stress can build up and become a problem. 
With that in mind, we spoke to some experts to find tactics that can help foster calm when stress gets too much. Number one, a positive stress mindset. A positive stress mindset is where something stressful is seen as an opportunity to be embraced because it may provide learning and achievement, says Dr. Meg Arrell, a psychologist speaking on behalf of HealthSpan. Dr. Arrell believes we can all start the day by shifting our perception of stress from negative to something more positive. This will boost motivation for a difficult task. Two, practice mindlessness. You're probably pretty familiar with mindfulness. This zeitgeisty meditative tool can be really helpful for combating stress, but it's not for everyone. Many people find practicing mindfulness difficult, explains Dr. Arrell. For some, she says, a more active mindless approach can be better. By moving our attention from being to doing, we can focus outwards in a way that is positive for both mental and physical health. For example, making art, helping others and dancing are all activities that concentrate our minds on doing, she adds. Three, embrace the Japanese art of wabi-sabi. The feeling that we need to be perfect can lead to an enormous amount of internal stress. This is compounded by airbrushed social media posts, says Dr. Arrell. But we can, re we can reject this pressure by exploring the art of wabi-sabi. This Japanese concept celebrates the imperfect, the flaws, the cracks and the creases of life. Embrace your imperfections, says Dr. Arrell. Four, vitamins and minerals. Dr. Arrell explains that chronic stress can deplete important vitamins and minerals. So investing in a multivitamin, such as HealthSpan's Multiviti Multivitality Gold, £9.95 for 180 capsules, healthspan.co.uk, can help keep your levels in check. Five, practice deep breathing. Deep rhythmic breathing is one of the simplest and quickest ways to lower stress in the body. Shallow breathing saps your energy levels, says David James Lees, a Taoist monk and co-founder of Wu Wei Wisdom. He believes practicing just five minutes of diaphragmatic breathing will help calm any racing thoughts that are negatively impacting your mood. Six, clear the clutter. Sitting among piles of disorganized paperwork, it could be subtly adding to your mental fatigue. Feng Shui teaches that your environment can impact mood, says life coach and Wu Wei Wisdom co-founder Alexandra Lees. I advise my clients to declutter their desks, tables and shelves, tidy under beds and clear out any junk rooms or cupboards. Seven, exercise. Exercise is vital for mental fitness. It reduces stress hormones and stimulates the release of endorphins, brain chemicals that act as natural painkillers, boost your mood and improve your ability to sleep. And finally, eight, let in the light. Natural daylight at home and in the office is a great mood stabilizer as it stimulates the release of the happy hormone serotonin, says Alexandra Lees. How difficult would it be to learn IT skills without having a computer? That's just one of the challenges faced by pupils in Ghana, which were witnessed firsthand by a group of teachers from Edmonton, Enfield and Haringey, who went on a trip to Accra as part of the Connecting Classrooms programme. Anne Palmer, principal of Nightingale Academy in Edmonton, who coordinated the trip, said, The schools in Ghana have very little... The things we take for granted, such as pens and pencils, printed posters on the walls and IT, they simply do not have. Most British schools would see IT having a life cycle of about five years, but in Ghana, that equipment would still very much be seen as useful. We saw IT being taught in theory without a single piece of IT to show students. 
If there is some way we can set them up with our old equipment, our direct links to them can continue into the future with video conferencing. We need to always be aware of how privileged our students are, particularly to have free education. Also on the trip were teachers from Aylward Academy and Meridian Angel Primary School in Enfield and Knoll Park and Trinity Primaries in Haringey. The teachers were partnered up with five schools where they spent two days getting to know the education system. Connecting Classrooms is run in more than 30 countries by the British Council in partnership with the Department for International Development, DFID. Magnesium is one of those supplements that seems to be everywhere at the moment, and yet very few of us actually know what it does. From keeping teeth and bones strong, to balancing hormones and supporting a healthy nervous and cardiovascular system, think of magnesium, whether consumed via supplements or eating a diet rich in dark leafy veg like spinach, whole wheat, nuts, and nuts and beans as the mineral that keeps your entire body ticking over on a daily basis. The average healthy adult requires around 270 to 400 milligrams of magnesium per day but research has shown that three quarters of Brits aren't getting a good enough fix. Here are six common warning signs to look out for. One muscle cramps. Magnesium is an important tool for muscle relaxation, so when your body is depleted of it, your muscles can involuntarily contract. Twitches, tremors and cramps are all signs that you're not getting enough, and in some severe cases, deficiency may even cause seizures or convulsions. 2. Chocolate cravings. If you're constantly hankering for a chocolate fix, it might not be down to your sweet tooth alone. When our bodies crave foods, it's often because they're telling us that we're lacking in a certain nutrient. And dark chocolate just so happens to be a brilliant source of magnesium. To reap the benefits, opt for a bar that contains at least 65% cocoa. What a wonderful excuse. Three, headaches. One in seven Brits suffer from migraines, but few of us know that supplementing with magnesium could help. Studies have shown that low brain magnesium levels could be related to migraine attacks, as magnesium is needed for proper nerve function. If you regularly suffer from migraine-like headaches, it could be a good idea to invest in a daily magnesium supplement. Four, trouble sleeping. Even a small lack of magnesium can prevent you from nodding off at night because it plays an important role in your central nervous system. Next time you feel insomnia coming on, try soaking in a magnesium-rich bath of Epsom salts to reap the full relaxation benefits. Five, anxiety. Mental health issues affect one in four of us, so it's difficult to tell whether your anxiety is linked to a lack of magnesium. However, getting more of it in your diet could help ease the symptoms. While magnesium won't cure your anxiety overnight, making sure you get enough into your diet will ensure that the 300 processes it affects are running correctly, which is sure to help you feel more relaxed in the long run. And now for a sports item. Battling Enfield Town fought back from an early two-goal deficit to take the lead, but ultimately finished empty-handed in an entertaining encounter with Staines Town at a freezing Queen Elizabeth II Stadium. It looked like Andy Lease's men would be in for a long afternoon when they found themselves 2-0 down inside 12 minutes against the playoff chasers, but the Towners were to be back on terms by the break through Jack Hockney and Tyler Campbell. 
Although they missed a penalty, it got even better for the hosts within five minutes of the, of the restart when Brad Watkins put them in front, only for Staines to then come from behind and secure the 4-3 victory. The visitors served notice of their intent five minutes into the contest when Mo Bettimer cut in from the right and his shot from outside the penalty area was turned behind by Joe Wright. But Staines were to gain the early upper hand when Lewis Driver received the ball following some good midfield interplay, avoided two challenges and fired into the top corner. One goal was to very quickly become two as Enfield lost possession from the restart and Bettimer latched onto the ball, drove into the box and beat right. Crucially, the hosts were to halve the deficit within six minutes following a throw-in and a ball into the box, with Wadkins knocking it down for Hockney to fire past Staines keeper Connor Hudnot. The visitors continued to look the more threatening, with Bettimer seeing another effort deflected behind, but their opponents were to level just before the half-hour mark. The Staines defence was caught out by Wadkins' quick free kick and Campbell fired past a surprised Hudnot. Minutes later, the home side were given a great opportunity to take the lead when Ryan Blackman was fouled in the 18-yard box, but his penalty was too straight and Hudnot saved. Despite that missed chance, Enfield did go in front soon after the break, when some confusion between Ugo Udoji and Hodnot saw Wadkins force the keeper into a rushed clearance. The ball bounced off the Enfield striker and he was able to head into the empty net. The visitors responded positively and after Sam Hutton had fired narrowly over from 25 yards and Wright did well to thwart driver, the Staines man netted a 68th minute equaliser following a cross from the right. Having got back on terms, the Swans were to score what proved to be the winner eight minutes later through an Elliot Buchanan backheel after a corner had caused chaos in the town box, leaving the beaten hosts 14th in the Bostic Premier Division table. Continuing with sports, the Enfield Ignatians delivered one of their finest performances of the season and boosted their chances of remaining in London 2 Northwest considerably after blowing away an understrength Chiswick side 43 3. Coach Ali Cook said, It was a great performance and it was a great indication that, that when we do get our mindset right, it brings out the best in us. It was a pleasure to watch and we played some lovely rugby. I also thought we did well to nil Chiswick on the try front. After a tentative start had led to an early Chiswick penalty for offside, it soon became a case of one-way traffic as the blue and golds pack took charge. Great work from the line-out and three offloads led to Matt Pollard going over for the first try before forwards and backs combined in unison for the second for captain Jack Bates. A fired-up Hardy Fayaz rode roughshod through tackles for the third before good carries from Charlie Hoy and Luke Stack ushered in a fourth try via Aaron James Nichols to make it a 22-3 at the break. Ignatians received an early second-half boost from an attacking line-out after Chiswick were penalised for a high tackle and the attacking probes close to the line led to the rampant James Nichols crashing over for his brace. After a fallow period, Enfield resumed the scoring when Bates, towering up and under, was perfectly weighted and eagerly devoured by centre Keith Kia, sorry, Bonar, as the hosts landed their sixth try. From the restart, Frank Antwi made good yardage upfield and after being shackled, the blue and golds banked left via the banks and opened the door for winger Harry Mazzini to roar in as Ignatians ended in style. Striker Tej Kennedy has been given the opportunity to make a career in professional football after being handed a trial by Charlton Athletic. Enfield Borough's top scorer has netted 24 goals this season and this has brought him to the attention of professional club scouts, including the League One side. The 19-year-old pacey forward 
who has been playing for the Panthers since March 2017, is hoping to become the second Enfield player in less than two seasons to join a league club after 17-year-old Romney Critchlow Noble moved to Huddersfield Town last year. Borough boss Marvin Walker said, Tage has been doing well in training with Charlton. He has linked up with Jason Yule's under-23 squad and they are keen to have an extended look at him. In the meantime, they are happy for him to continue to turn out for Borough, which is good for us. He is a very popular member of the squad and we are happy to have his presence both in the dressing room and out on the pitch. We have reached the end of our programme for this week. Thank you for listening. So it's from the team of Jenny, Roxana and Sonia and Dem on the controls, it's... Goodbye. Goodbye. Please remember to turn over the, the address label in your postal packet, put the memory stick into the packet in a closed position and return it to us as soon as possible in ready, readiness for the next edition. Don't forget you can call Diane de Jersey regarding any help you may require in connection with the Enfield Talking newspaper on 020 8805 65 Seven, eight. Coming up next, the latest news and information for the Greater London area from InfoSound. The Enfield Talking newspaper will be with you again in two weeks' time. <laughs>